Hello guys, this is Matt and I have a confession for you guys. I never completed a Dead Space game before. And after finishing Resident Evil 4 for the first time in August of last year, that became a personal game of the year and it made me focus on Dead Space. Because even though I already tried this game before, it was just too scary for me. So realizing that Dead Space was hugely inspired by Resident Evil 4 and the latter is not actually scary for me but still is the best game I've played last year, Dead Space has got to be my next in the iron sights of completion. Which is also very timely because the remake has just come out with so much glowing reviews and I have got to experience the original game for myself to have that valid comparison of this remake. So, after completing the original Dead Space in 2023, here are my findings. Spoiler alert guys, it's really good. So the game opens up with a video of a woman named Nicole calling out to a guy named Isaac. Then the video pans out and is revealed to be a physical video log. A vlog playing in real time as part of the game environment. This immediately sets the main focus of this game, diegetic design. This means that all the elements of the game are existing within the same plane of existence as the player. All the store moments and all the gameplay mechanics coexist within the player's direct environment. We'll see what this means in practice as we go along. As Isaac is strapped to his chair, a story moment plays out and this would normally occur in cutscenes in other games where the player can put the controller down to simply watch the scene play out, but this initial scene in Dead Space is occurring within the player's viewpoint with the gameplay camera already oriented in place and the player has the ability to move the camera around while Kendra and Hammond are talking. What's impressive about this is that this opening scene and probably the very last boss fight are the only two scenes I can recall where the player cannot perform the full action mechanics due to the current state of the player in the scene. In this case, for example, Isaac's sitting in this chair so he can only move his head around. Probably that makes sense, right? But for the rest of the game, the player is always in control of Isaac, even in those crucial story moments. You can still move around, aim, shoot, melee, stomp, and perform basically all the game's established mechanics at all times. This is what we call universal mechanics, and this is what I and other fans love about Resident Evil 4. Once the game has given you the ability to perform some actions, you should always have that ability to perform them as organically as possible. Even if it means sometimes missing story beats here and there when you're just mucking around during these crucial scenes, that's your fault, not the game. However, the designers of this game still made some compromises in that some doors are forced shut when story moments play out so that players will not entirely miss important scenes. I love this approach because it strikes that perfect balance of narrative and player agency. And I find this so shocking because Dead Space is a game from 2008, but it still nailed that one-shot camera trick better than God of War from 2018 in my opinion because player control had to be ripped out constantly in that game with unskippable cutscenes. It may look seamless when you're a spectator, it looks impressive for the uninformed, but playing that game is anything but seamless. Dead Space, on the other hand, took the Half-Life approach and made the entire experience truly seamless. To quote Adam Sessler in his description of Gone Home, The game is the story, and the story is the game. Both are one and the same. This dedication to an organic experience pervades all throughout the game. And this is where diegesis comes in. Just like Far Cry 2, which also came out in 2008, all of the gameplay menus in Dead Space are real-time. 
This includes your map, inventory, objectives, collectibles, and even your waypoint marker. Even upgrading your weapons on the bench and going into the store won't pause the game as the camera will simply transition its focus from Isaac to the items on the menu. But all these things won't work enough if the rest of the game isn't able to support its ambition of immersion. And boy, does the rest of the game deliver. Let's start with the atmosphere. For me, atmosphere can be further broken down into two elements, lighting and sound design. Let's start with the sound design in this game because it is particularly interesting. I won't be focusing on the music because it just does the job and there's nothing remarkable about it and that's perfectly okay. But what's worthy of mention is how they compose the soundscape of the overall auditory experience and how they used it to affect gameplay. Because you still do have those usual background noises, creepy voices, and the different music cues to denote combat states. But the most effective design decision they implemented was the use of diegetic sounds. Almost every object that gets bumped or moved around generates some form of noise. This means that on top of the enemy screams that are creepy in and of themselves, the accidental physical interactions with props also cause tension and stress. I find this effective because this type of tension and fear is not cheap but organic and real. In other words, majority of these scares you'll encounter can come from your own actions. There are the usual jump scares here and there, but most of the scary moments in my experience came from the things that were not triggered by the game. It's just me, and it's awesome. So that's one half down. The other is the lighting, and it's excellent. And it's not just because of graphical fidelity, since some aspects do look dated, especially the textures on some enemies. However, the lighting model coupled with the art direction in this game elevate this game into a coherent experience. For the majority of its duration, I love how the game relies on real-time lighting to generate mood and play around with your expectations. How they play with shadows to unnerve you and provide suspense is very effective to me since this affects the way you play and manage your resources. Not all the areas in this game are consistent though and some sections do look flat and uninspired which kinda turned me off at the beginning to be honest. However, after completing the game, these low points are very rare and are exceptions rather than the rule. All 12 chapters in this game have their own distinct color palettes which is quite surprising to me considering the entirety of this game takes place in a single location, the USG Ishimura. And boy, what a location this is. The USG Shimura is one of the most well-crafted environments in a horror game. You can excel in atmosphere all you want, but if your level design sucks, then I think it's just meaningless. But the Ishimura is not just memorable, but it is believable, immersive, and very interesting to explore. I was worried in the first few chapters that the environments may feel repetitive and indistinguishable from one another, but fortunately, every level has their own thematic brand that even if the entire game is basically one giant spaceship, or planet cracker in this case, the journey inside the ship is very memorable. Every level starting chapter 2 has multiple objectives. Bringing up the waypoint marker might point you to one objective, which makes the game very linear if followed that way, but the actual progression of objective completion 
is entirely up to you. This means that you can explore any given location according to your own pace with the help of your 3D map which shows you the geographical scope of your objectives. But here lies my first negative, and that is the map. The 3D layout is not just helpful at all in providing an accurate orientation of your location. Moreover, the controls in the map screen are quite unreliable and manipulating it just feels unintuitive and more confusing than it actually is. But this negative somewhat highlights the beauty of Ishimura's design in that all the levels are fully traversable without any use of the map at all. The game starts out with simple corridors and eventually expands in scope but all throughout the journey, the different layout of pathways, corridors, rooms, elevators, and set piece sections are all realized by a chapter specific art direction which culminates in levels that are surprisingly memorable and quite unnerving. I especially love how they incorporate metroidvania design in their levels where there are these moments where you'll end up back to previously locked rooms that were once inaccessible in early levels. It's just a small thing I know but it is very effective in selling the Ishimura as one cohesive space. Now let's talk about combat which is the main method of activity in this game. Usually people praise this aspect of dead space and indeed it is unique, but I still have some gripes with it. Because while the combat does avoid being generic by incorporating the limb targeting system as its main mechanical selling point, I found the combat scenarios to be very safe and ironically afraid in taking risks to subvert this kind of playstyle. Sure, focusing on limbs rather than the head is novel, but as the game went on, it never expands upon this principle and instead relied mainly on adding newer enemy types with different variations of limbs to shoot at. To be fair, there are later enemies that will punish you for shooting their limbs, but all it leads to are more enemies to shoot at. What I was looking for are combat encounters that would challenge your playstyle and force you to adopt another approach. One particular example would be the on-rail section in chapter 7 where you are stuck in a slow moving lift and you had to combat projectile shooting enemies while gathering around using kinesis. I was hoping the game would evolve its combat like this where you are placed in new scenarios but the majority of combat encounters are very cheesable by just finding a corner and waiting for enemies to come to you, even in the later levels. Take note that I played the game on hard difficulty using just a plasma cutter and still I found the game quite easy until the end. To be clear, the combat is not bad. I was just left wanting more depth and complexity to the encounters. They tried to incorporate anti-gravity traps which are basically death floors on some levels but I still found them lacking since the levels are constructed with lots of safe space around them. And there's just no tension between managing enemies and avoiding these traps which could potentially lead to fun moments where enemies can be kited into these traps to conserve ammo. I was hoping that that would be the case but enemies can easily avoid these traps as well since there's just ample safe space around them. But we still have the set piece sections and for the most part, they're okay. Not bad, but not the best either. Most of them involve puzzles and some combat but they aren't particularly memorable to me. Now before I get to show some examples here, please be warned that I'm going to reveal certain gameplay sections so kindly use the timestamps below. So there's this one section in chapter 4 where you go outside the ship and take cover from incoming asteroids. It's just unengaging to me because there's nothing going on and it feels like a superficial game of Simon Says. It then leads to a very jarring turret section which is just a huge contrast to the quality of the rest of the game. Thankfully, this was the worst example that I can think of and majority of the game fares much much better than this. But even if they are improved, later levels still rely too much on zero gravity which kind of feels dated in its control scheme. 
You can only move to a specific spot in a straight line, and the freedom of movement one would expect in a zero gravity space is not realized here at all. Still, engaging with enemies in zero gravity is tense and I love the added challenge of finding your bearings as soon as spatial orientation changes. You also have to be particular of where floating items are so you can manually grab them with your kinesis while keeping enemies at bay. The later puzzles also rely too much on throwing stuff at stuff and dragging stuff, especially at the end of chapter 11 and the entirety of the last chapter. Yeah, they kinda mix it up with combat encounters, but this gimmick just became too tiresome for me. Others may have no problem with this, but for me, quality game design means introducing one idea, expanding upon it, and then proceeding to another idea. That is what made Portal so iconic, and that's also why Resident Evil 4 became a game of the year in 2022. It just knows when to introduce a certain gimmick that requires full understanding of the game mechanics, expands upon it, but never uses it again. That may be unfair for Dead Space, so this is more of a personal wish list rather than a direct problem with the game. And it has space basketball. To be fair, the game shines when puzzles and combats are mixed together. And there's plenty to be found in this game. I especially love one chapter where you have to transport a battery from one plug to another, and it makes for a very tense yet enjoyable experience since you're doing things that's beyond your comfort zone. Manually carrying the battery around while shooting at enemies, it's just pure chaos. And there's this room that requires you to move around shelves while twitchers are scrambling to get you. This is when the game truly shines the most. This tug of war in decision making just makes progressing through the game entertaining and meaningful. Let's take the upgrade system for example. As you progress, there are these nodes you can pick up or buy at the store which you can then use to upgrade your weapons. The interesting dilemma comes when you encounter locked doors which can only be opened when one of your nodes is spent. So do you prefer this cipher route and spend your nodes to upgrade that gear or take the risk and spend that node on that door, not knowing what items are inside? This keeps the mystery fresh all throughout the game since some of these locked doors also contain journal logs. And this is probably the best implementation of journal logs in a video game. I just love how the amount of these journal entries have the right count that picking them up never becomes repetitive or banal. Also, the game is very specific in telling you which logs are audio, video, or text. Most importantly, the information contained in these logs are not just boring personal monologues, but believable transmission logs that help flesh out the events and give you an idea of the much larger picture since all the information you have is limited to what Isaac himself has experienced along with you as a player. This is just pure genius to me and simply a testament to how coherent this game is as a whole. But with regards to the story, there's a lot of nuances to be said. On one hand, I love how simple and straightforward it is. There's no bloated stuff in here and if you break down the entire game to its mission objectives, the journey of Isaac and his crew is clear, believable, and surprisingly mundane. On the other hand, the objectives in each chapter are so grounded and faithful to Isaac's occupation as an engineer that the entire game comes across as one huge fetch quest. And this is partly due to Isaac being a silent protagonist from start to end. Now, I myself would prefer a silent protagonist than a poorly written voiced character, just because silence means there is no room for any disconnect between the action on screen and your own reactions as the player. However, while Isaac being silent worked for the most part of the game, it is during conversations before mission objectives that the unfortunate side effect rears its ugly head. 
without Isaac speaking. All objectives are initiated by the other characters, which means that the game has Isaac running errands all the time. This is why I'm excited for the remake because this specific issue is directly addressed and I love how they made a compromise in that Isaac will still be silent during gameplay but will also speak when engaging with other characters. That is the best course of action for me. I love that. Now, my last problem with the game will be a spoiler alert, so please be warned again. This is all about that twist. Or rather, the non-twist. Because I just cannot find any evidence that the game wants you to believe Nicole is real. On the contrary, the abundance of references to hallucinations from Kendra and other audio logs is so tellingly obvious that Nicole is a hallucination. Also, meeting her for the first time, it's very jarring and out of nowhere. And to be fair, she does act like a normal human being during that escort sequence, but then she disappears again for a considerable amount of time and there's just no emotional bond that's emanating from her. As if it's not obvious enough, there's this scene at the end of chapter 11 where the game is basically slapping you in the face with all the horror tropes they can throw at you. It's so painfully pathetic that during the eventual reveal, I was expecting Isaac to react like he already knew Nicole is dead. But at least we got to see Isaac emote inside his suit. It's actually funny and sad at the same time. So that's it for me guys, yes I may have highlighted several problems with the game, but overall I still love this game. Not just liked, loved this game, and I still found it to be a much better experience than today's AAA games. Finishing this game made me more excited with the remake and especially Dead Space 2. It is such an honor finishing this game in 2023. And this just proves that great games will always remain great regardless of when you played them. Please do tell me your thoughts on this game guys and until then, take care and bye bye.